This is Twit. I bet there's a precedent for what's happening today because it's the silly season for phones. We got foldable phones. We got snap bracelet phones from TCL. We got the weird form factors. I bet there's a precedent in technology that when sales flatten, people start going weird. That's a sure sign that you're at the end of the line for a pro for a cat. There yep. totally is. Yep. I can tell you exactly. So if you go back to 1998, 99, um, if I'm sure that all three of us were in the same boat, I was carrying around, not to be fair, I lived in Japan at the time. I had a digital camera that doubled as an MP3 player. Oh yeah. Like an right old school digital camera. Yeah. Um, I had a mini disc player. I had a separate Wi-Fi sniffer made by Canary that I, I would carry around. <laughs> I remember um, those. Yeah. No, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I had a GPS device that turned like that connected in a weird way to my um, BlackBerry once I bought a Pearl, and that kind of sort of generated GPS using the um, the waypoints from the, the phone. So like I had all of these all of these devices started getting weird, right? And there was this yeah. convergence that happened over the next couple of years. And the end of that convergence was the beginning of the iPhone. So the iPhone comes out and suddenly we have all this compute in just one device and all these features. Well, now two decades later, we're starting to see a divergence back in the other direction as we have things like smart earables, which collect our bio data and also let us play our music, um, smart yoga pants, that <laughs> <laughs> dog better, oh. right? There's all these other things and the phone is once again retreating into the background. But it's, you know, something I think about a lot is, I, I don't think it's just me. I have started to get the thing where my neck is just killing me from looking down at my phone oh, yeah, all the time. Do you neck. know what I mean? Yeah. And like, just, I don't know, being in this position all day, I don't think humans are meant to bend like that. And I can't wait for it to get <laughs> to the point where it's in your glasses and you just don't well, so have to deal with all of that. And it's not just bending down. So there's some really interesting work um, by a couple of uh, ophthalmological and optometric associations. So not lobbyists, like credible researchers. Um, within the next couple of decades, ov the overwhelming majority of people in Western countries are going to be nearsighted. Um, oh, and the reason wow. for that is, oh, and there wow. is a reason. The reason is that our our biology is not evolving as fast as the technology. And as humans, we our eyes have been engineered to see far, not near. Huh. And, and most of us are increasingly, and I happen to know all this because my husband's an eye doctor. So, <laughs> so, so he, there is a whole new um, disease called computer vision syndrome, which causes, it's a real thing. And it causes dry eye and neck cramping, some of the stuff you're describing. And it is all because our eyes were never meant to stare at a screen that like very close to our faces all day long. And certainly right. not to go between near and far continuously, which most of us are now doing. So that's going to make this transition into wearing smart glasses and possibly contact lenses, though that'll be much further out in the distance. Yeah. Um, that, that will help accelerate that process. We're not meant to sit either, I suppose. I mean, what's that doing to us, sitting in mm -hmm. a chair all day? Yeah, so we're really in an unnatural kind of situation. So are you saying that I wouldn't be nearsighted today if I, uh, I don't, what did I do when I was a kid? Read a lot of books. I always so, thought that was a kind of a, a not true. No, it, it is true. Oh, so if you're boy. somebody, um, I mean, it's, it's a, it's heritable. So if you have nearsightedness or extreme farsightedness or yeah. whatever else, it's probably because your parents did, but for kids who spent a lot of time reading yeah. or for kids who are now spending a lot of time looking at screens, they have a much higher probability of having sight visions much Holy earlier cow. in life. Holy cow. Ooh. Well, that's uh, cheerful. Um, that's a good lead into HoloLens, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, what's going to happen when we get augmented reality? I I mean, I uh, honestly, once they're like they were in your show, that seems like the glasses that both of you are wearing yeah. and I would be wearing if I weren't wearing contact lenses. And maybe they'll even be contact lenses. And you maybe will have something in your ear so that you can that's hear. Right. And that's right. That seems like, so do you think that's what's going to replace the smartphone? So again, this is the models that I've been working on for a while, the data driven models. Um, but right. So, so what we are probably looking at is a slow transition away from our smart, like in a decade, the smartphone 
functions that we currently have in our Androids and iPhones are going to look a lot like the flip phone of yesteryear. Um, and there will be holdouts, but more and more people will transition into wearing smart glasses, which for a time will still require a secondary device like a ring or a wristband. And in the early days of this, they'll use our phones as connective tissue because the compute will still need to wow. happen somewhere near us. But increasingly, as we've got AI in the cloud and serverless computing and all of these other things happening, um, and we can, once actual 5G networks, not what people are calling 5G <laughs> right now, um, are deployed, uh, we won't have issues with latency, you know, all of the other challenges that we have today. And so that, that transition from thing that we hold in front of our face to thing that we wear on our face um, will become much more seamless and natural. And in the interim, we're doing, you know, you made me think of my uh, Palm 7, which oh, I had. I Remember that? Crazy. I loved it. It I was a Palm, it. but in order to give it wireless connectivity in the days before we had smartphones, they had a crazy antenna. Yeah. And and it, in order to make it useful, maybe you had to get a folding keyboard. <laughs> uh, and I think the folding phones are kind of... In that same goofy ballpark, this is TCL's foldable phone, which turns into a bracelet. Or, uh, is that why you're wearing the flip bracelet? This is yeah, because snap bracelet. Because it kind of is like a snap bracelet. I don't, I don't think that the way that you put it on is like that. Oh, see, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> You've already cracked the screen. <laughs> but here's here's a question I have about screen. So so Samsung has a folding. Folding phone. The fold. I swear to God, yeah. you you look at the S9 the wrong way and that thing cracks. Yeah, well, how are they going to keep these from falling apart? I don't know. No, the better question is, what's how do you have a phone case for a folding phone? Right? Well, in a way, I think the Galaxy Fold, because it has a screen on the front, small screen, and then you open it up for the big screen, that's a little easier to put in a case because closed, it's kind of like a case. You'd have to have a case that opened up. It's kind of like a so traditional So we're back phone. to like those leather cases that my yeah. parents had with yeah, their a note, a notebook case. early. Yeah. Fact, I, I have, don't know. I think I, a, I definitely that, think there's a there's a use case for these foldable phones. Like I get that a lot of people it seems gimmicky. I really agree with you, Leah, when you're saying like when they start well, a, rolling a out the weird phones, goofy. That's when yeah. it's really See, that's not this is a daytime. Yeah, right? yeah that's and it, and it's a little sm bigger than that. Um, the weird one, though, I don't I don't think what makes any sense is the phone from uh, Huawei, which folds out. So that I don't know where how you put that in a case, because that has its screen on the outside. And but apparently there are cases. People are making cases or planning to make cases. The other issue with these is they're ridiculous. The three thousand dollars for the Huawei, two thousand yeah. dollars for the fold. It we we should also the 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 idea of a dual screen phone has actually been around for a while and yes. there've been a bunch of chinese companies making um literal flip phones so right. screen on either Nokia's side Nokia's got a new one um there was a Meizu uh, phone out for a while these were crazy looking dual screen phones that very few I never saw anybody using but the the, the difference now is the sort of folding without losing the the pixels I mean, I'm really into the idea of a foldable phone. Everywhere I you go, I carry I carry my iPhone 10 with me, and I carry my 11 inch iPad Pro just because, you know, if I have 10 minutes, like read the New York Times, I just like the bigger screen. It's easier to type on there, and I just think about like a, an iPad. How can they really start innovating on the iPad? It felt like more than the iPhone, they hit a wall with what was bringing consumer value. And I think something you could fold up more easily to put into a purse, I just, that's a gadget I would very seriously look at. There is a question about, though, as you pointed out, this, this one screen that bends in the middle, what's this bend going to end up? How many times can you close that before it starts getting right. a crease? Yeah. This, I kind of like this model. This is more, I think, what you're talking about. This is from TCL. They're not making it. It's a concept. But it's two screens with a hinge in the, in the middle. Uh, you don't. You want a big screen. You want a screen all so, the way across. Yeah, I don't. We actually wanna, researched a lot it. of this going into the the show, um, and ultimately, I kept coming back to folding is interesting, retracting is better, though, right? Um, I I could see a device that we retract, or it, it's almost like tiled. 
um, and more modular. So at one point, Google had something called the Aura phone, which never oh, actually yeah. went. They had a, yeah. right, they had a little testing bed in. in the they inherited this from Motorola when they bought them. It was a modular right. build your own phone kit. The series right. there was not everybody wants the same capabilities. So you could buy the modules you like and snap them together into a phone, which That's sounds right. so, like a Lego phone, but a little okay. bit, but it, it kind of made sense. And yeah. Sony has been, Sony now has these panels, these sort of Sony tiles, um, and you can fit together any number of them to sort of build your own display. So I could see in a, a handful of years, a tile concept phone that, that, you know, again, allowed you to build some more functionality, but Leo, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, once technology starts getting silly, that's usually an indication that we're on to something else. And, you know, we how many people use a physical typewriter? How many people use a, um, I had a brother word processor, you know, just sometimes That was technology. an interim device, right? A little bit of computer, sure. a little bit of typewriter. It had a little that's tiny I screen. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think we're in the interim device space. That could go on for uh, a while though, because 5G's at least two or three years off. Definitely. In, in fact, I saw one analyst say, oh, good news, 5G will be available in 2025 to a full 32% of the nation. It's like, well, that's a third of the nation in three years? That's not... Where are the small cells coming from? We're, we've got an antagonistic relationship with NIMBY. China right now. Yeah. Who's going to build these? We're, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot to be figured out. So, I, and I agree with you, that's a prerequisite. You have to have fast... Mm -hmm. Easily available, um, uh, low latency is important too, and that's one of the features of 5G uh, networks. We got to solve the battery issue. Yep. The, the HoloLens is a fairly hefty device with only three hours of battery life, right? So, and and if you start reading about how they actually do the um, you know the lenses inside to go into your eyeball, like this is a very 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 complicated gadget. Like if you start reading about how HoloLens and the pupillary distance that they calculate every time you put it on, I just, uh, it's like an iPhone. I could always see how that would get to the point of being a mainstream consumer thing that anyone could afford. But I'm looking at the technology for these glasses and you start thinking about miniaturizing the battery or producing these very, very complicated lenses that really need to be made individually for the person. And I start wondering if it's going to be something like HoloLens or if like that's just a stop off place before we get to neural interfaces. Like so, what's going to be yeah. easier, like replicating that through the eyeball or just telling your brain what you want to see? So I, I think the other important thing is um, we, we've gotten used to a mobile phone as a singular device that does a lot of things, whether it's for enterprise or for individuals or for government. As we diverge back out for a time, we're going to have different headsets that serve different purposes. So HoloLens, the, this new version of HoloLens is just for enterprise. It's not for individuals. And it has a limited number of applications. The applications that it does have are pretty awesome. I saw um, th there's a really cool application where you can see through walls. So if you work in contracting, in construction, um, you know exact, they, they can overlay the blueprints, which interestingly is where all this AR started, right? In industrial oh, really? um, assembly uh, lines. Yeah. yeah, that's where it came from. So that's kind of interesting. There are some really interesting uh, applications for training for like surgeons and other things like that. Then there's the magic leap side. Um, which at the moment, the battery pack, the compute sort of happens on your body and the glasses look silly. Um, but the idea there is that those would become a, a more um, easy to access consumer device and the glasses will look more like what I've got on, uh, which is normal looking glasses, um, you know, that, that can also provide that refraction. Um, but then there's this whole other school where maybe the future is more about retinal projection in some cases. So I, again, like, I think this is one of those things where we're going to see wacky, weird technology for the next probably 12 to 15 years as all of this gets sorted out and there's experimentation and there's convergence and divergence over and over and over again. So if you're into gadgets, this should, like we should be in the golden <laughs> era of wacky gadgets for the next decade or so. I think what, uh, I don't know if either of you read uh, Blake J. Harris's new book, uh, The History of the Future. He basically had a ton of access to Facebook and Oculus, and he was there uh, basically chronicling the downfall of Oculus and fo following uh, Palmer Luckey around for the entire time. 
Yeah, if you read why Oculus ultimately failed, I think it's because they had like this, they were over-promising, right? They had this big grand vision of us basically living in Ready Player One. What I like about HoloLens and what they're offering this time is it's, it's such a narrow vision of what you need. A really good example, I ride a motorcycle and often I like to ride motorcycles to like events when I can. You can't touch a smart screen when you're on a motorcycle because you have on uh, gloves, right? Like capacitive touch screen, it can't access that. So uh, a motorcycle helmet with AR built in to show me like map, to show me information that I can't access on a phone, that is something I would very happily pay $3,000 for because it's about my safety. So I think like, I think almost the reason all of these ideas failed is we tried to promise everything. And I think Microsoft is doing the right thing by focusing on just a few things and doing them very well. Contractor schematics, like, you know, doctors and operating rooms, all those things. It's also good for Microsoft's business because it sells yeah. Azure, which is really the really all Microsoft cares about. I wonder, <laughs> and Amy, you could probably correct me on this, but I wonder if we're not making the Malthusian mistake. So Malthus predicted that we, the world population, if it continues to grow at the rate it's growing, will run out of food and everybody will die in like the year 1910. <laughs> it, it didn't happen. And I think we may be making that mistake with technology because we've been living in this era of Moore's Law where just things got cheaper and faster at, at tw doubling every 18 months. And we kind of expect that to continue, except that I think we're kind of, I believe we're kind of hitting the hitting the, uh, the edge here, the wall. Battery technology, we're stuck. Somebody's going to have to make an amazing breakthrough. There's some huge paradigm shift. That's it. Because we've been trying to make this better for a long time with little success. 5G, I think, is a lot harder to implement than anybody admits. And there's a lot of issues that are going to get in between us and 5G, including the Huawei issue, which we'll talk about. Computing technology is going to get smaller, but we don't, but interface de design has not advanced at the rate it needs to for us. To, look at the Apple Watch, which is smaller and clever and has the worst interface ever designed. <laughs> It's, it sells, but but in, despite the interface. Do you see what I'm... It, it, I, I'm yeah. sure as a futurist, you think about this. We can't just assume it's straight line. Sure. So, so right. So as a futurist, my job is not to make predictions. Um, it's to gather data, run models using that data, and make connections to try to figure out where we're headed. So for a while... So, you know, there are some linear throughputs that sometimes make sense, but we've sort of reached this point where um, breakthroughs in one technology tend to cause an acceleration in the research and the breakthroughs in other technologies. Um, the problem is when our patience level and our enthusiasm for technology butts up against reality. And that happens, you know, a lot. It happens, uh, it happened in the 1980s when, um, after lots and lots of promises about artificial intelligence that failed to materialize, um, people started, investors, the government stripped away funding um, because the the practical realities and the commercialization of technology didn't pan out the way that, that they sort of, that the, that the hype had promised. So we do run into a problem over and over again, and it, it's cyclical. When um, we do, we get these like, inflections across lots of different technologies that cause this burst of activity. And then all of a sudden, everybody expects sweeping change quickly, which of course never comes. On top of all of that, um, you know, to, in order for us to have, for example, 5G, like who, who's going to build that? It's, it's not part of our national infrastructure. Um, we have four major wireless carriers. And at the moment, it would cost a lot of money for them to build out all of those cells and, and there's a there's a lot there um 5g so might be in the same is, position uh fiber is sure now didn't we sure. think oh, fiber, fiber was going to change the world i, you know, I have to say the Trump cities. administration just came out this week and they're talking about nationalizing 5g and having yeah that is uh, interesting the, that's a the, good idea i'm not i'm not automatically <laughs> against that I'm, no he, think, their position yeah. is reasonable which is it's it's yeah. critical national infrastructure 
Yeah. The problem is when I hear the Trump administration say that, <laughs> I, you have to read between the lines. It's not really nationalize it. They're they're against nationalization of anything. That's socialism. What they right. really are saying is we're going to have a consortium of corporate interests that will determine. What I'm guessing it's going to be is the American people footing the the bill to so that AT and T can make more money. AT and T and Verizon <laughs> yeah. to put this yeah. infrastructure in place hey, for them. We got, this sounds like a bad idea. We got fiber, me. and 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 <laughs> I've heard it said that we got fiber because of the dot com bust that there was so much money flowing into the markets at the end of the century, people were overbuilding fiber, much of it's still dark, uh, and then it crashed. But just the yep. same way we got the railroads in the, 18, in the 19th century, and then all the railroad uh, companies went bust, but we still got an intercontinental railroad. We have intercontinental well, so fiber, but it's all dark, right? So a couple of quick things. Um, yeah, correct all my historical mistakes. No, 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 no. Please. Uh, the first thing I'll say is we live in a different era. And I think we are less likely to go along with eminent domain for, for the good of everybody. That's right. We're just, our culture has evolved. That's right. And so this is why you don't see a lot of transportation changes. Yeah. And to lay fiber means to temporarily disrupt or permanently disrupt some of our streets and some other things. And you know, we have enough uh, transcontinental fiber. We don't have it to the curb. We don't right. have it. Now, the last mile problem, right? The last mile problem. In you know, I'm. I think again, a lot of times the big companies get this get a bad rap. Um, you know, I can I can tell you because I I know some folks who worked on part of this project that in Philadelphia, where Comcast is headquartered, um, you know, a, several times in Philly, in Baltimore, in some East Coast cities. Um, Comcast was working with the local city government to um, to, to bring fiber, and the city governments, the individual <laughs> city governments, were expecting all of these big concessions and big payouts, and you know, and and um, they thought that they were playing hardball. And in, in reality, what they were doing was making it so extraordinarily expensive to to lay fiber per foot. That it was easier for Comcast to say, you know what, we we like, why would why, you know, why would we bother? Why are why are we doing this? Um, so, I think I think, the, the, but this is another key piece of this. Whether we're talking about five G or we're talking about AI or whatever technology, um, you know, there's always multiple sides to what's happening, and it's easy to blame the big tech companies. It's, it's very easy to complicated. Blame the government. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Of course it is. Yeah.